This is a demonstration of the Exidium Advanced Endpoint Protection Platform. I'm sharing two desktops here. Uh, the first one is the one on the top here with the blue background. Uh, this particular desktop, as uh, each of them have Exidium configured, but in the blue desktop, I've disabled all of the automated responses. And I did that simply so you could see what happens as it happens, because when it's all automated, much like it is here with the green background, it happens too quickly, you really can't appreciate it. Let's take a closer look at what's installed on the endpoint. I have two clients sitting in my tray here. The first one is the communication client. This is the client that enables our unified console to communicate back to each of the endpoints and also to make policy changes and to control the endpoint from a remote management perspective. Also provides patch management software inventory. You can pull metrics off the endpoint. You can even run remediation actions on the endpoint. A whole suite of controls available through the communication client. The second one is the client security. This is actually providing the layer protection on the endpoint. Let me open it up so you can see that layered protection. I'll pull up the window shade here and you can see the various layers uh, of protection that the endpoint is providing. These are all Exidiums. The first is antivirus. Uh, these are all the standard controls for known ma malicious malware, worms, all hash based, continuously updated throughout the day. Uh, the second one here is firewall. This is a standard software based firewall that allows you to monitor or restrict communications by ports or IPs or groups thereof. Now, the advantage of this, and actually each of these, is that from a unified console, you can have a known configuration across entire groups of systems. This one here, HIPS, this is host-based intrusion prevention. This, in conjunction with our scripts engine, covers those whole host of activities, things like VB scripts and PowerShell scripts, registry-based attacks, memory attacks, suspicious processes, that whole lot gets caught in this layer here. Now the last two, website filtering and DLP monitoring, these are included as additional capabilities if you'd wish to use them. Now, when I went through this list, I skipped auto containment and I did that because it's different. All of the others deal with detection. Auto containment deals with prevention. And it's real simple. If it is an unknown, such as a zero day, no one knows about it. All unknowns are auto contained which means it never executes out in the open, which means the endpoint is safe. Workflow continues, productivity continues. Now, when something is contained, Viroscope is running right alongside it, collecting the telemetry information, and we'll try to render a verdict on that, whether it's uh, good or bad. Now, if it can't, then it will actually send that information up to our included verdicting system in the cloud, which does use machine learning. And that will race through that and render a verdict. Now, sometimes machine learning cannot automatically render a verdict. And in those cases, uh, that's when it would get forwarded over to engineers who will manually deconstruct that, run through all the analytics and will render a verdict, but that will take longer. The takeaway point here is that that really doesn't matter how long it takes to render a verdict because the entire time it is contained on the endpoint, the machine is still functioning, the machine is safe, productivity continues. Let's tuck this away for now. You'll notice on my desktop, I have policy update. I have one on each desktop. Uh, let's go ahead and open this. I received it recently. Let's read it so we can carry about our day. Now, as I invoke this, you'll notice in the widget that I have displayed here that I have something running in containment. So I'll open that up. I will remove the administrative controls so I can see what's going on here. And yes, policy update is contained. Now, if I right click this, I get a little menu. It allows me to do additional things so I can see greater detail of what's going on. So as I select activities, I can see that it actually launched and I can see all the sub activities below that. Now this will continue to update as the process is running in containment. So it'll keep track as things progress. This list will grow over time and you can come back and look at those details. Of course, there's an array of different options you can choose to look at here along the way. Now, policy update launched uh, and it's in containment. And here it comes. You'll notice that uh, the list updates. I'll just go ahead and close that. Let me just slide this up. You'll notice that it opened in WordPad. WordPad is a known safe application that ships with the operating system. But there's something else going on here that is unknown, and that's why it's actually wrapped in this thin green border. That means it's safely contained, so it's isolated from the endpoint. Now, even though it's isolated, I can still work with my file. 
and carry on. Now, it's contained because of that unknown part that's happening here. And what actually happened when I invoked policy update was that I launched a piece of ransomware that contained a full disk encryptor. So right now it's running through my system, encrypting everything it can get its hands on. It's going to ultimately pop up with a ransom note asking me to go to some URL, plug in a pin, uh, cough up some cash if I want my files back. Uh, that's actually what is underway now, but it's contained, so I am safe. And since it's contained, we can actually go and take a peek at what's going on. I'll open up my file explorer, take it to my C drive, and you'll notice this hidden folder called VT root. VT root only appears when containment is active, like it is now. Let's go take a peek. Just drop in here. I'll go into my folder. And let's look at my pictures. Almost all of my images are encrypted, or so the ransomware thinks. But if you look carefully at the path up here, that says VT root. That's not where my pictures are kept. My pictures are kept right here. So if I open this up in a separate window, you can see that clearly that my pictures are perfectly intact. Let's just put this back up at the top. So my pictures are OK. I can carry about my day. I can work with my document, but my endpoint is still safe no matter what happens here. So in short order, the ransom note will appear and give me a time frame to go and act on that if I even want uh, my data back. Now, since this is contained, I can actually go manually clean this up. I did mention that I turned off the automated responses, so this will be a manual cleanup here. And you'll notice this is my ransom note. It's also wrapped in green, so I'm not really worried about this. Let me slide this off to the bottom. Let's go clean this up. I'll open up my client security. You remember this from a few minutes ago. I'll click on tasks. I'll run over to my containment tasks and reset that and just simply erase it all. You'll notice that VT root is gone because containment is no longer active. My pictures are still intact. This was all done for illustrative purposes, so you could see that. But in a day to day environment, it's all automated, much like it is over here. So let's navigate to this endpoint that has it all automated. I've got the same policy update. I'll go ahead and open it. What you'll notice right away is I get a little pop up that says it's contained and blocked. You'll notice it's been ripped off my desktop. It's not even in my recycle bin. And all I'm really left with is this curious Windows error message, which is essentially Windows complaining that it can't finish executing it because Exidium ripped it out of its hands faster than it can finish. And this right here is really the extent of user interruption or even user interaction when a piece of malware slides into an endpoint. Now, this is the endpoint perspective. The other perspective is the administrative console in the cloud. I'll just navigate back over to there, and I'm already authenticated in my console. Fairly interactive. I can do whatever I need to do here, uh, but I noticed that I had some contained files. So if I click on this, it'll take me to my alerts, and for all of those activities, I can actually see all of the information about every alert that is triggered. I really want to go to my contained threats over here, so I'll go ahead and click on this and you can see, yes, that policy update was contained uh, and we found it on a number of devices. That doesn't matter because it's been contained across all of them. Since this was running in containment, uh, it actually uh, did get uploaded to the verdicting system and all of that deta details are right here. The check Exidium verdict cloud details. I'll go ahead and click on that. You'll notice it leaves me on my console and opens up a separate tab drops me on the summary of the analytics for the analysis. We do have provide you all the details for the static and dynamic analysis, but we drop it all into a kill chain report for you. Just a quick look at this provides you with a, an array of tabs to interactively look at it, but know that all of the data is in a single PDF that you can download for your internal consumption, archives, investigations, etc. Policy update. It's run. If this was actually your code that accidentally got caught in containment with a single mouse click, you can free it up and now it'll be allowed to run in your organization. Now, how do you get this deployed? How do you get it configured? That's right over here with assets, devices. 
in this unified console. When I pull this up, you can see the devices in my environment. You'll know immediately if they're online or offline. You'll know the machine name. You'll know the components that are installed, who's logged in, the activity, et cetera. If you have groups and organizations, then you can actually place them all into your specific groups to match your organizational requirements. Let's take a look at a specific device here. I've clicked on this device and now I can see everything about the hardware, the operating system, the version, when it was booted, the security status, the performance metrics that we're pulling live off the system, all that you would expect in a summary tab there. The networks tab is going to show you all the network interfaces and the exact configuration of each. The associated profiles, this is the configuration applied to a group of devices of which this is one. Software inventory, yes, we know everything that's installed on this endpoint. And if you find something that's not supposed to be there, you can with a single click uninstall it without having to get on the endpoint. I won't go through all these tabs. I'll briefly look at patch management. When you do that, you'll see it's broken out into operating system and third party. So I can see all the OS patches I have available as well as third party. I know what versions installed and which ones queued up. If I'm good with these, I can actually update the endpoint without having to get on it. Now this row at the top, this is all of the integrated remote control capability built into the platform. The first one is remote control. You've actually seen this already. When we were looking at our endpoints, you'll notice the remote control in the header. We're actually using this, our own internal integrated remote control capability to get into each of the endpoints. File transfer allows you to push and pull files accordingly. The remote tools allows you to interface with the endpoint without necessarily interrupting the user or taking over the device. So you can browse the file systems and push and pull files. Uh, the processes, the services, you can even run things on the command line if you need to. The procedures, there's over thousands, there's over a thousand procedures built into the platform. For example, I can run a procedure on a device, get BitLocker status of the drives, and this would actually run it on this device. I can run it as either the local system user or the logged in user and invoke that. I can install additional packages and uh, just click the ones that I need to and push out and it can do that readily. If you have your own custom MSIs and MSUs, you can do that as well, either to individual devices, to groups of devices or all devices. And of course, all the requisite power options that are available when you have remote control. Let's come back to the associated profiles where all of this is configured and controlled. So here's my associated profile. This is that profile that's controlling this endpoint that we were looking at. Now, these are all the components that I've added to my profile, and there may be more that I could add, such as a maintenance window or a proxy. For each item in here, I can actually just take a look at each piece. So here's patch management. I have the ability to turn on or off the third party and the operating system. I just make my changes, press save, and it immediately applies to all of the endpoints. We looked at procedures briefly uh, earlier with, a, with BitLocker. Uh, so if you put the procedure into a profile, it will run across all the devices that use that profile on a schedule that you can determine. Now, sometimes a monitor may be more useful than a procedure because a monitor would look for a condition to be met before running an action. Here's a simple example. Here's my monitor, gave it a name. I can have as many conditions as I want. And if the condition or conditions are met, run this procedure. This one says delete the system temp, internet temp, and browser cache files. Okay, under what condition would you do that? And there's actually quite an array of options under each one of these, but uh, let's use the one that I've already configured here. This says free space left on the system drive. So this would automatically detect when the system drive in my environment, any one of them gets less than 10%. And then it would go and delete the system temp, the internet temp and browser cache files, thereby removing this error condition. So it does the detection and the remediation without human intervention. Very powerful feature. How do you get it deployed? That's pretty straightforward. I'll go back to the assets devices and there's two main options. There's lots of permutations in each. 
Uh, a popular option is the bulk installation package, where you, if you have the ability to push software through GPO, SCCM, or any other method out there, they'll go right over to bulk installation package and they'll do this. They'll click download installer. Here comes my MSI, and you'll notice this pop up auto discovery and deployment tool. This allows you to push Exidium code out, but not just that, you can push any code out to your devices via Active Directory, work groups, IP ranges, et cetera. I'll just press download if you would like to use that. Here's my MSI, drop it into a, a group policy, for example, if you have Active Directory, and then when a user logs in, it downloads and runs, and in very short order, it's registered in the console and looks like this. This is the communication client. Now I know the machine name, I know what's installed, who's all logged in, and I have full control because I can remote control. I can install the rest of the Exidian packages. I have all of that access at my fingertips, and I can actually move all the devices into their appropriate groups. The other option here is the enroll device. This is actually a wizard that only has two steps to it. So when I click it, I can choose the operating system that I'm interested in. Enroll is just the communication client. Enroll and Protect is the communication client plus client security. Since I selected Windows, I have the option of choosing 64-bit, 32-bit, or hybrid. I can select the profile, the configuration that I would like to apply to these devices. I can set my reboot options and device name options accordingly, and I get uh, an enrollment link. Most people won't go to a link if you, click, if you gave it to them, so the bulk installation package is often the preferred method. But I brought you here for this device right here, this uh, supported device platform link, which opens up a separate tab, and it's the middle column here that I wanted to bring your attention to. So you can see the list of Android and iOS uh, versions, Mac OS, Windows XP forward, Windows Server 2003 forward, and an array of different Linux variants. This concludes the demonstration. Thank you.